When our children were small, we used to play a lot of Bible games. <clears throat> this was one of the favorites. Bible trivia, the game where trivia is not trivial. It's a pretty good game. It had lots and lots of Bible trivia questions. I have to admit that oftentimes we would, we would have teams, and since there was only four of us in the family... It usually ended up being a parent with a child. And I'm pretty good at Bible trivia. And so oftentimes my children wanted me on their team. I get daddy. No, I get daddy. Now, if we're playing Bible Pictionary, totally different, totally different subject. If we were playing Bible Pictionary, you know, where you have to draw, my children would say, you take him. No, you take him. No, you take him. They didn't want me. But for Bible trivia, I was pretty good. So here's a few Bible trivia questions for you from this game. What did Absalom catch in a tree? His hair. Good. That was the Old Testament question. Here's the history geography question. What motto appears on American coinage? Yeah, it's not really a biblical question, but it's a good question. Uh, There's also a prophecy uh, category. It says, in Daniel's vision, what did the third beast represent? Greece. Greece. Very good. Very good. Greece. Of which, this is the name section. Of which son of Noah was Abraham, a descendant. Shem, very good. These are much too easy, aren't they? (laughs) Complete the following sentence from Psalm 51, verse 4. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned. sinned. I should find some harder questions here. Uh, Well, you get the idea. When you play Bible trivia... The key is to know the right answer. To know the right answer. Now, it seems to me that some people live their Christian life with the same philosophy. If only I know the right answer, I'll be saved. Is that true? Maybe not. Knowing the right answer, but. Well, let's look at uh, the right answer. Matthew chapter 2, 1 and 2. Matthew 2, 1 and 2. A question is asked and an answer is given. It's a familiar story to you. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah, Judea, in the days of, king, of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. The question, the Bible trivia question for the Scholars, for the prophecy studiers of the Israelite empire, of the Jews. Where is he who was born king of the Jews? Answer. The, the, Herod goes to the Jewish authorities. Verse 5 of, of chapter 2. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet... And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least amongst the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Where is he who was born king of the Jews? Do they have the right answer? They have the right answer. No question. This is, as we saw in a scripture reading, the prophecy of the Messiah from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. 
the Jewish leaders knew the right answer. But what did they do with the right answer? You see, that's the question. Is it enough to know the right answer? But what do you do with the right answer? Most of you may not realize that during the time of Jesus, there was a messianic fervor. People were thinking that this is the time for the coming of the Messiah, or the Greek word is the Christ. Let me just share with you a couple examples that that show us that. John chapter 3, verse 28. John chapter 3, verse 28. It's in the same chapter as Jesus coming as Nicodemus coming to Jesus. But this is later on, and it has to do with John the Baptist. Verse 25, it says, A discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. So there's this discussion going on. So they go to John, and look at verse 28. John says, You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him, the Messiah. Christ means Messiah. John says, I am not the Messiah. People are expecting the Messiah. They see John out in the wilderness preaching. Is this the Messiah? John says, I'm not the Messiah. John chapter four, verse 25, in the story of the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus is speaking with her. In verse 25, the woman says to Jesus, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. People are expecting this is the time of the Messiah. And I personally believe that Jesus understood and so did the Jewish authorities understood that the, the prophecy of Daniel 9.25 that pointed forward to the coming of the Messiah. I think Jesus understood that. And so there's a messianic feel. But, but there's this problem that... What the Jews wanted, what the Jewish authorities wanted in a Messiah might have been different than what the Bible tells about the Messiah. Remember the problem, the the Jews are under Roman rule. They were occupied by a Roman army. They are taxed. They are oppressed. Their religion is being stifled. And so what do they want? They want a Messiah who will be a deliverer. And so here's the Bible trivia question. What will the Messiah do? Psalm chapter 2, verse 9. There were lots of messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. Psalm 2, verse 9. Psalm 2 was recognized as a messianic prophecy. Psalm 2, verse 9. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Trivia question, what will the Messiah do? He will break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Is it the right answer? It is the right answer. It's not the whole answer, but it is the right answer. Numbers 24, 17. Numbers 24, 17. <clears throat> this is in the prophecy of Balaam. Numbers 24, 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall ca- come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Is that a messianic prophecy? Yes, it is. What will the Messiah do? He will crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Is it the right answer? Yes, it is. It is a messianic prophecy. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 Many of you will know this prophecy, especially those of you who love the Messiah. Isaiah 9, 
Matter of fact, we're going to hear this verse in just a little while again at the end of the service. Isaiah 9, starting with verse 6. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father. Of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Is it the right answer? It is the right answer. But it seems to me that it wasn't the full answer. Because while it emphasizes the increase of the government and of his and of peace and there will be no end it doesn't tell everything about Jesus they wanted Jesus to come as a conqueror wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace they didn't want a prince of peace they wanted a prince of war to drive the romans out so while the answer is right it is not complete because they had failed to see other passages like Isaiah 53, which also describes the Messiah. Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Is this a description of the Messiah? Right answer. But they didn't see this answer. Isaiah 9, 2. I just chose these out of Isaiah because they were convenient to each other. Isaiah 9, 2. Before the last one we saw, it says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. Jesus was going to come and be a light to the world. But the Jews had no interest in being a light to the world. They wanted to be separate. By the way, the word Pharisee means the separated ones. You know, they they emphasized certain prophecies and didn't deal with other prophecies. They selected their Bible quotations very carefully. Very carefully. I had a professor in college. His name was Douglas Waterhouse. Doug, Doug Waterhouse always used lots of different translations of the Bible. And I discovered that Dr. Waterhouse used whatever translation of the Bible that agreed with his opinion. You know, well, yeah, the King James says this, but listen to what the Jerusalem Bible says. And now I've discovered at this point in my life that I do the exact same thing. (laughs) So I can't be too hard on Dr. Waterhouse. You know, it seems to me that 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 was the problem of the of the Jewish scholars. They quoted certain Bible prophecies that bolstered their point and they brushed aside or ignored other Bible prophecies that didn't go along with their point. And of course, you've never seen a preacher do that, right, today? Of course, we all do that. Every once in a while, I'm listening to a preacher and I say, yeah, but what about... But I can't ask him that question because it's usually on the radio or something like that. We don't always look at the full picture. So what's the right answer? Where is he who was born king of the Jews? In Bethlehem of Judah. By the way, did you know there were two Bethlehems in the time of Jesus? There was a Bethlehem near Jerusalem and there was a Bethlehem in Galilee. And I don't think I realized this until I traveled to the Holy Land my first time about 20 years ago. 
Bethlehem is, a, is what we would call a suburb of Jerusalem. It's very, very close. In a tour bus from the area of the old city to the, to the town of Bethlehem, maybe 15 minutes to walk. I can't believe it would take more than an hour. It's a suburb. So where is he who was born king of the Jews? Well, Bethlehem. But here's the problem. It's not just enough to know the right answer. What will you do with the right answer? What do you do with it? Here are these Jewish priests who know that Jesus, the Christ, not Jesus, but the Christ, the Messiah, is to be born in Bethlehem. They've heard rumors. There's this fascinating quotation from the book Desire of Ages in describing the, 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 the priests and the rulers. It says that when the wise men came and began to inquire of, of the of the king and the priest, where would the Messiah be born? It says this, the priests and elders of Jerusalem were not ignorant concerning the birth of Christ as they pretended. The report of the angels' visits to the shepherds had been brought to Jerusalem, but the rabbis had treated it as unworthy of their notice. They had heard stories about the shepherds Seeing these angels in the sky. But they had this attitude. Well, if the Messiah had really come, he wouldn't have revealed himself to a bunch of smelly shepherds out in the field. He would have come to us, the elite of the nation, the religious leaders. And so they discounted the idea that the angels had come and revealed themselves to the the shepherds. She further writes, they themselves might have found Jesus and might have been ready to lead the Magi to his birthplace. But instead of this, the wise men come to call their attention to the birth of the Messiah. I've, I've wondered to myself, why did the star lead the wise men to Jerusalem instead of Bethlehem? Think about that for a second. Why didn't God just take him the most direct route, take him directly and have the star over the manger in Bethlehem? Why did he take him to Jerusalem first? Because God was giving the priests another chance. He wanted to give them another chance to to believe, to follow with the wise men to Bethlehem. They knew the right answer. They weren't doing anything with the right answer. Furthermore, when the wise men came... The priests felt like this. Why would God reveal the birth of the Messiah to a bunch of heathens instead of us? And so they totally discounted the possibility that God had revealed himself to these wise men. She finishes this off by saying, They determined to show their contempt for the reports that were exciting King Herod and all Jerusalem. They would not even go to Bethlehem to see whether these things were so. It was all about arrogance. It was all about authority. It was all about feeling like you're something and nobody else is anything. It's what it was all about. They knew the right answer, but they didn't do anything with it. Because it didn't help them find Jesus. The whole purpose of knowing the right answer, small a, is so we can find the right answer, capital A. Because Jesus is the answer to all of our questions, to all of our needs. There's this text in... John 5, it's not part of the Christmas story, but it illustrates what I'm trying to say. John chapter 5, verse 39. This text has been used in many old Bible study, old format Bible studies. The old format Bible study says, you know, ask the question and then it gives you the text and then you're supposed to write the answer. Some of you have done those old format Bible studies. 
they're really pretty effective. This one used to be used to ask this question, usually on the Bible study on the Bible. The question went something like this. What does Jesus tell us to do? And it only makes sense if you read the verse from the King James Version of the Bible. Because the King James Version of the Bible, John 5, 39 says, search the scriptures. So that's what you're supposed to write. Search the scriptures. It's supposed to be an example for us to search the scriptures. Well, in fact, John 5.39 is not a command of Jesus to study the Bible. It is a rebuke of Jesus for the way the, the scribes and Pharisees are studying the Bible. Let me read it to you from John 5.39 and 40 from the English Standard Version. It says this. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness unto me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. What's Jesus saying? He says, you read the scriptures and it's all about me and that, and yet you miss it. He's not telling them to read the scriptures. He's condemning them for the way they read the scriptures. They read the scriptures and get all the right answers. And yet the real answer is standing right before them and they refuse to acknowledge him. See, sometimes it's not enough to know just the right answers. The purpose of the right answers is to lead us to Jesus. That's the purpose. A number of years ago, I was um, right here in my office. Someone called me and said, um, somebody I knew said, I've decided I'd like to have Bible studies. Cool. It's like saying sickum to a dog, right? (laughs) For somebody to say that to a preacher. Wonderful, I said, you know, so we made an appointment He came to my office. I knew the young man. He was the son of uh, someone who had worked many years as a teacher in our denomination. He had been raised in church school. I'm sure in his home, they had had family worship, a spiritual family. And yet, as he had gotten into his 30s, maybe even 40 at that point in time, he had fallen away from the Lord and he, um, he was living a lifestyle that was very, very difficult, very bad. He was a very heavy drinker. And yet inside his heart was this desire for something better. And I knew this, I knew this about him, so I was just so glad when he came. I said, I want to have Bible studies. So he came to my office, we sat down there in the office and, and I said to, to him, tell me what you'd like to study. Tell me what you'd like to study, what you'd like to do, what do you need to study and how would you like this to happen? He said, well, he started telling me about the things that he knew. It was very obvious to me, this guy knew his Bible. He knew all the right answers. So he said, well... I think I'd like to study the the book of Revelation because I don't understand a lot of the book of Revelation. He wanted to do theology. That's what he wanted to do. And so I said, well, we could do that. But let me suggest to you just a little different approach. So I left my office, went back into the literature room, and I pulled out this little set of lessons. It's called, it's only six lessons. It's called Steps to Jesus. And I also pulled off the shelf the book, Steps to Christ. I took him in my office and I said, let's do Revelation later, but how about we start with this? I could look at his eyes and tell he was very disappointed in me. He didn't need to study about Jesus. He wanted to do theology. But Jesus is what he needed No theology was going to help him change his life. 
Only Jesus was going to help him change his life. He was halfway offended. He told me this later. Halfway offended that I should think that he's a baby Christian. And yet he didn't understand that you can know all the right answers without knowing Jesus. And it seems to me that this is, a, this is a challenge for Seventh-day Adventists who love the truth. We love the truth, don't we? We love to study the truth. We want the right answers. We want to know the way. But unless, unless we let the right answers lead us to the one who can answer all of our needs and all of our problems and all of our questions, it's really of no more value than a Bible trivia game. You might win the game, Bible trivia, but you'll lose your salvation. So the purpose of the right answer, small a, is to lead us to the real answer, capital A. I have a friend who preached a sermon one time. He was a pastor in Ohio, Ron Vozar, Jan. He preached a sermon entitled, Missing Heaven by 18 Inches. Now, I don't want any of you short people here (laughs) to think that there's a heavenly requirement for height. What he meant was missing heaven by 18 inches. And that's the distance between your brain and your heart. He was suggesting that it's possible to know all the right answers in your brain, but not allow it to change your life, to change your heart. It's good to know the right answers, but what are you going to do about it? I pray for you that during this Christmas season, when everything is focused on Christmas, you'll see beyond Christmas and find Christ. Well, we're going to do something very special as we close this morning. We're going to uh, have a singing of the Hallelujah Chorus. This is kind of a, if it were a sport, we would call it a pickup game. (laughs) So if you're going to be singing with us, please, I invite you to come forward. If you've sung the Hallelujah Chorus before, even if you haven't practiced, we invite you to come forward and sing with us. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>